you have to overcome your fears or you will always be like people always tell me I'm living vicariously through you. And I'm like, I don't want you to live through me. I want you to live. A movement is underway of people abandoning the emotional, physical, and financial expenses of city living and crafting their own purpose, livelihoods, and joy in the rural reaches. The Urban Exodus podcast shares the wisdom, wit, and stories of those who decided to embark on the road less traveled to pursue their own interpretation of the good life. Small business owners, change makers, artists, farmers, and more working towards building a better future for themselves and their fellow citizens. This podcast is for country dreamers, rural folk, and urban dwellers alike who want to feel more connected to the natural world and the purpose and choices in their lives. I'm Melissa Hessler. Welcome to the Urban Exodus. I'm excited to invite you to my conversation with Katrina Harvey, the passionate driving force behind Soul Botanical Farms in Mulberry, Florida. Katrina became interested in plants after the devastating loss of her father and her sister, spending time convening, conversing, and working with plants was the medicine she needed to heal herself and to find joy and passion in life again. What started as a hobby has evolved into her life's work, and now she is working towards building her own farm. All right, Katrina Harvey, it's such a pleasure to speak with you today, and I've been following your gardening journey for quite some time on Instagram, and I'm just really inspired by you and your work ethic and your way of figuring things out and that you're sharing all of the knowledge that you're learning in your journey with everyone else. So pleasure to have you on here. And I just love to hear a little bit of your personal backstory, where you grew up and your journey to where you are now. I am so excited to do this interview. Me and you've been talking back and forth and you've been supporting my journey. So I've been gardening for three years now. My sister, actually, I started gardening because my father passed away from a brain tumor. And then the following year, less than a year, my own sibling, she passed away from kidney failure. The thing is, like my father, I knew five years before he was going to die that he was going to die. He told me he had a brain tumor. And he said that this was it. There's no way he's going to you know, come back from that because he had lung cancer and they was able to get rid of that. Then he had a growth on his liver and they cut that part out. And he went into remission with both of those. And he had open heart surgery. And when he got the brain tumor, he pretty much knew that was it. So he let me know five years prior to him passing that he was going to pass. And even though you know someone is going to die, it's still like in my mind, I was preparing for that moment. But when that moment came, it still wasn't something I could handle. And the same with my sister. She had been on kidney dialysis since she was 20 years old. She died when she was 41 years old. So all of my life, like half of my life, I have been preparing for that moment, thinking, okay, I can handle this. And because I've always been a strong person, but I'm an introvert. So to me, my, the people that surround me are mostly family and close friendships. So I became very close with my father. I didn't meet my father until my 30s. So for 10 years, I got to forgive him for abandoning me and get to know him. And so I felt like with the death of my father, it wasn't that bad. You know, it just became really bad because when my father died, my sister had been in a coma for a whole year. So she did not know that he had passed away. So she woke up. Right after he passed away, she woke up out of her coma. She couldn't talk because she had a trach in her throat. 
and she could write things. And I'll never forget, like it was the weekend of the funeral and we were in the nursing home because they had a, a nursing home rehabilitation place. And we were sitting there and family was there because they came in for the funeral. But my mother and my grandmother didn't want to tell her my father died because she had been in a coma for a year. So they didn't know, you know, how she could handle it. I remember her saying, Pops, she made that with her mouth, but she couldn't speak. So it was a guy that was short and balding. He passed by her room and she thought it was him. And so I remember just walking out the room and crying. And then because we couldn't tell her he had passed. So like a month later, she got back on Facebook and she was doing really good. And she messaged me on Facebook and I was at work. She was like, why didn't I tell her that he had died? Because my mom made a mistake and said that she was going to visit his burial site when she went to visit my sister. And that's how she found out. And I just walked out of my office crying and I didn't know what to say. And I told her, I said, well, you know, you were in and out of the coma. Like she, it was a couple of times she was clinically dead, her heart her heart just stopped and they were able to bring her back. And my grandmother was like, no, don't tell her because she didn't feel like she could handle it. And then I just broke down crying and I was like, we didn't want to tell you because, you know, what you were going through. And she told me, I'm a big girl. I can handle it. Don't ever keep secrets from me and I forgive you. And so it was her birthday. We went to the hospital and she wanted, she couldn't eat. She hadn't eaten food for two years. She was eating out of tubes because she was in that coma. So she wanted pork chops and lima beans because my grandmother cooked for her and she brought it and I bought her cake and she ate it. And she was like in good spirits. And I really thought she was coming home. So my grandmother called and said she had to have surgery and it was 50-50 chance of her living or dying. And she would die if she didn't get the surgery. And she could die if she did the surgery. So her son was an adult at that moment. So he the one made the decision to do the surgery. So she ended up passing on the surgery table. So it really, like, hit me hard. Like, my dad, I was able to, you know get back to living after he, he passed, it hurt. But when she died, it was like, it just tore me apart. Like I couldn't function. I had to, you know, make myself go to work. So I had got in the mold for two years of going to work and coming home and her death, it brought up a lot of repressed trauma that I didn't know I had repressed. And I didn't know I had like abandonment issues with my parents and because she left me because I was at that point where why are people that I'm close to being taken away from me so it was just really hard for me I would go to work come home eat jump in the bed and go to sleep and that was my routine and my dad had told me before he died because he would come and talk to me and sometimes pick me up from work he was like you just exist and he was like you go to work and you come home and you lock yourself in the room and that's it. Because I moved in with my parents after my 18 year relationship that ended with cheating. So that was something else that was bringing up that repressed abandonment issues because I'm feeling like everybody is leaving me. You know, everybody I love that's close to me is leaving me. So me and my dad had got real close and he was like, you just exist. I'm like, you don't know what you're talking about. I am living. But it hit me after my father and my sister died that he was right, that all I did was go to work and come home. And my sister, who had been on kidney dialysis, she lived a life way more than me. And she was homebound a lot. Like she experienced things. She still made a way to be happy. And my cousin, who she was really close to, she messaged me after my sister died. She said, and I didn't even know that my sister had died that night when we went to for her birthday celebration. Her heart stopped. And she told my cousin, 
she had clinically died and they brought her back. And then she started joking with my cousin and laughing. And my cousin was like, she's the strongest person I know. How do you die? And then you come back and you joke. So it just dawned on me that here my sister is, she was sick for 20, half of her life she was sick and couldn't experience things. Now she was a plant person and this was way before me. Like she always had plants in her house. She always had pets and fish and stuff like that. And she loved cooking and she just did a lot. So at that moment I was like, there's no way I'm going to leave this earth and not experience things for her, like physically going places and doing things. So I still was going through depression, like I was depressed, I was angry, I had a bad attitude all the time, and my coworker started bringing me plants to work. She would bring me succulents, and once she started bringing me plants, I just started feeling better. What a good coworker. (laughs) I know, I was terrible towards my coworkers, and I was mean, because I was not in a place where I was happy with myself, so it just showed outwardly and when I look back at myself I'm like you really was a mean terrible person to people and me and her because me and her really didn't get along and then we just started talking all the time and she would just bring me all types of plants and bring me books about plants and buy me stuff that was plant related and I just started going to the garden center and buying plants and filling up my home with plants and the more I filled up my home with plants the happier I felt So then I had a friend who told me about meditation and he said, you need to go out and sit in nature and sit, sit near water because it helps you, you know, get rid of your issues. And and so I started doing it. I would go to parks and just sit out in nature and talk to the trees and talk to the plants. And so there's a local botanical garden in my city and I would go and sit there for hours just sit there and look at the plants and look up what the plants were. And I would feel good. I I no longer had anxiety. So I started traveling far to far places to go to different gardens to sit in. And I would talk to my sister while I was around the plants. And then it dawned on me, I would still come home and be depressed. And it was like, even though I was getting better, the depression was still there. Something was still missing. So it dawned on me, you don't have to travel to experience plants. Why don't you bring plants home? Because at the time I had a massive backyard and nothing. I was spending money to have them come and spray chemicals and mow the lawn. And I was like, why don't you just start planting flowers and plants in your yard? So I went to my grandmother's house. And she she would say, here, get this plant, get that plant. And she started giving me plants and I would go home and plant them. And so I felt a whole lot better. I was like, you know what? If I can grow, you know, ornamental, why can't I grow food? So I'll never forget. I went to Home Depot, bought a pepper plant. It was a jalapeno pepper plant, brought it home. I brought it inside because at the time it was in November, so it was kind of getting close to winter time. And even though I live in Florida, I was a new beginner to gardening. And I, I thought, you know, 60 degrees was just too much for plants. So I would just bring the plants in or cover them up, just be real protective. I don't do that anymore. <laughs> the peppers started growing and it just made me feel good. So I went and bought some wood and made a small two by two raised bed, bought some collard green starters, planted them in my garden, and they grew so beautiful during the winter. We ended up harvesting them for New Year's. My grandmother cooked them for me. And so I started buying wood and making a raised bed like every two weeks and adding it to the garden. I had no idea about plants, but I would sit there and watch YouTube videos of different people I would watch people who live in Canada and Chicago and the UK and I would try to grow the things that they were growing like lettuce and spinach and living in Florida. It just really didn't work out. Garlic, 
But the more I started gardening and, and reading and learning and start understanding my grow zone and following people who actually live in Florida that garden, the more I started understanding the things I needed to do. I wanted to have, at that moment, I'm a tea drinker. My grandmother started me when I was a little kid. She would always warm up me and my sister hot tea, and we would sit and watch cartoons and drink tea. And I said, you know what? One of these days, I'm going to sell my own teas from the things that I grow in my garden. I'm going to sell my own seeds. And this was like three years ago when I first started out. I had already mapped out like this is what I was going to do. This is I'm going to retire from my corporate job because I'm a database programmer in corporate America. And I am going to be a chicken farmer. I remember five years ago, I told my GM I was going to be a chicken farmer. Had no idea. I wasn't even into gardening but my great grandfather was a chicken farmer. And that's something I remember from my childhood. And I felt like that's somewhere I needed to go back when I retired. In my mind, I said, when I'm 65, 70, that's what I'm going to do. Not realizing that my path was leading me to where I am now, because I was trying to go a certain way with the big, huge, massive four bedroom house, living alone. Like the most I was in my house was plants. And, but it was like, that wasn't my path. I ended up downsizing because I said, I want to buy land and I want to have a farm one day. And I can't do that living the lifestyle that I'm living right now. So something's going to have to give. I'm going to have to sacrifice this lifestyle because I wasn't happy. I was not happy in that house because at the end of the day it was just me in the house i thought when i bought this massive house you know the family the friends the it just wasn't like that i did have family coming over but it wasn't like in my mind i was thinking it was a every weekend thing and it just did, ended up not being like that so it was like you know what downsize i was gonna go the whole tiny home route but I'm glad I didn't because I ended up moving into a small, single wide mobile home. And I was like, this isn't big enough for me. Like I was trying to cram everything from a four bedroom house into a small, single wide mobile home. I ended up having to give away uh, like half of my possessions. And I said, if I would have went to a 250 square foot tiny home, I was not ready. But I felt like this was preparing me for the next step that I will be ready. So my final dream is like to actually have acres to move a tiny home, but in the onto, but in the meantime, I want to farm. So what I ended up doing is looking for land. Now my, you followed me initially. I wanted to purchase the land that is next to my grandmother's. And they wanted $20,000 for that. And it's just a small lot. And the taxes, the property taxes would have been more expensive because that land is inside the city limits. So I started thinking, you know, you can't let the mindset of you have to do it in this community in order to benefit the community, that you can go out into rural America I started researching my great grandparents who were sharecroppers. They come from Live Oak, Florida, which was, it is still rural America, and they lived out in the country. So I started looking for land outside the city limits that were out in rural America, and that was zoned for agriculture. And that was another issue I would have to face living, trying to set up something inside city limits, I would have to try to get the zoning change and having to go back and forth. So I was like, is it really worth it? Why don't you start out here where it's already zoned agriculture and then you build from that. And once you start making money from that, you can expand your farm to other areas. And that's where I'm at now. So I have a tiny piece of land, 0.27 acres. And it's zoned agriculture. There are farms already around me, cows and 
fruit groves. So I'm already in the area that I need to be in. And I wanted to do it small because I was like, I don't want to take on too much and be overwhelmed. Because I know me. Like, if you give me five acres, I'm going to work five acres and wear myself. Uh, I can tell. <laughs> and I'll wear myself out. And I'm like, no. Yeah. And I was like, just. You know, build a system, get used to it. And then once you build a system and make it easier, then you can move on to bigger and better things. So that's where I'm at now. That's honestly it's so smart. I feel like a lot of people, when they are working on those big dreams that they've always had, they try to bite off more than they can chew and kind of get overwhelmed and then things kind of fall apart. And so by taking it in stages, it's it's such a smart way to go. Can you describe your home garden and your new land and also the challenges and the benefits of living where you do? My home garden here is, it's very small. So when I moved, because I probably had a quarter of an acre in my old home of land And when I moved here, it's like really small and the grass, there was no grass. And I had, I have a hill, a slope. I've never planted on anything like that. So I was depressed. Like when I moved into the home, I was really depressed and I was like, there's no way. Cause I came from a beautiful garden. I had just threw together in months and then to this, and I was like, there is no way. I can make this beautiful like it was. And then I had no plans. I just went out there and just started building raised beds and planting because I already had a whole bunch of plants from my old home. And I just started planting all of them all over the place. So right now I have tons of fruit trees. I have lemon trees, two navel oranges. I have tangerine trees, papayas. I have about 10 papayas in my small space. I have moringa trees, mulberry. So I do more of a herbal, medicinal, and perennial type gardening because my first two years, I decided I like the annuals, but I don't like the annuals because it's so much work of having to keep redoing everything every season. And in Florida, I can grow four seasons. So I try to grow four seasons. Like some people in Florida, they don't grow in the summer because it's too hot here. So they pretty much like cover up all their beds and don't even do any gardening during the summer because they heat the bugs and the rain. But I try to do it like I'm like, I can grow all year, so I'm going to grow all year. But so my home garden, it's more like edible landscape. So what I love doing is looking for edible stuff, whether it's flowers. So I plant things like calendula, Jamaican soil hibiscus, which is edible. The leaves are edible. Cranberry hibiscus, different types of hibiscus that you can eat the flowers. So I'm more into make it look cute and make it look like, you know, it's landscape, but people don't know I can eat these things or I can make tea from these things. My neighbors will come over and they'll ask with my hibiscus bushes, what is that? And I'm like, oh, this is a hibiscus, but I use it for tea. It's good for high blood pressure and stuff like that. And they're just blown away by it. So that's how my home garden, gardening space is. But my farm is called Soul Botanical Farms because I'm focusing on medicinal and herbal flowers, herbs, fruit trees. A lot of people don't know the fruit tree leaves are medicinal. I use them for tea like guava, papayas, moringas. Even the lemon, I make lemon leaf tea. It's very good for you, healthy for you. So I try to plant things in my garden, shrubs like jasmine, the kind that are that I can use for tea, that I can either use for medicine or use as herbal tea drinks. So that's what my farm is mostly going to be focused on, as well as planting native plants. There's a ton of medicinal native plants that I'm adding, like goldenrod, 
fight a wart, but I still add other pollinator stuff because I love butterflies. I love raising butterflies and I love helping the monarch population. So if I plant something in my yard, it's always related to medicine, butterflies, or I don't know, just butterflies and bees. And I'm also going to add a beehive on my land as well. This episode is brought to you by the workshops at Howe Hill Farm, a new photography and creative workshop series brought to you by Urban Exodus. Workshops are hosted online and at our farm headquarters in Midcoast, Maine. The workshops at Howe Hill Farm offer learning experiences that encourage you to experiment with new techniques, hone your creative vision, and advance your professional opportunities. Check out How Hill Farm's full lineup of online and in-person offerings by visiting the workshops page on urbanexodus.com. Stay up to date on courses and happenings on the farm by following at How Hill Farm, that's H-O-W-E-H-I-L-L-F-A-R-M on Instagram. It seems like a lot of the learning that you've discovered about growing and plants has just been trial and error and YouTube and figuring things out. What advice do you have for new growers, people that maybe just have a really small space, but they want to grow something, but they feel intimidated by the process, by the startup costs and the time investment involved? My advice is because I'm always being asked by new gardeners, The biggest problem I see is wanting to take on too much at one time and wanting to grow everything that you see other people growing. Take the time to research, you know, what exactly is it you're trying to accomplish in your garden? Because some gardeners, they're just all over the place and it can get so confusing. People come to me and they'll ask, well, can I grow papayas? And they're living in a cold climate. And, you know, I try to tell people, yeah, no, you're going to have to have a greenhouse and you're going to have to put it in the garage, but it's going to suffer all winter. So it's like the, the biggest thing I try to encourage people is learn your grow zone. They'll ask me, what's that? And I'm like, go on Google and look up your grow zone. And then search, seek out other people who live where you live right now that is already a gardener who is already doing what you want. Like one of my pet peeves, what I have with my gardener friends is they're constantly telling me, I bought this new fruit tree. I bought this new plant. I bought this. And I'm like, just calm down and stop buying all of this stuff because you haven't mastered the plants that you have already. So when those types of things happen, that's when you start seeing gardeners saying, this plant isn't growing right. What am I doing wrong? Because they don't take the time to understand what a plant needs to thrive. And not only that, but what pests these plants may have. And I think with me, I like to companion plant where I do biodiversity. I have so many different flowers and plants all over my garden that for a long time, people thought that's all I did was plant flowers. And a lot of people have come to me and say, I'm so thankful for following you because before you, all I planted was vegetables and I didn't plant flowers. And they don't understand the importance of including flowers along with your vegetables because that'll help keep you from using chemicals because I don't use any chemicals, organic sprays, powders, any of that in my garden. I feel like if something is eating something, then I'm doing something wrong in a certain spot and I need to fix the environment that that's growing in. It's not happy there. It's not meant to be there. So I think a lot of gardeners come in with big intentions. They see a lot of seasoned gardeners who a lot of us, we show all of our beauty and we don't always show the bad. Like I have bugs, I have aphids, I have things eating things. I don't focus on that because I grow extra. I tell people that too. Always grow 
extra because something's going to always eat something, but it's not going to be like Martha Stewart type garden. No, <laughs> it's going to be ugly and you don't have to get frustrated about it. In Florida, Florida gardening can be very intimidating and frustrating. I have gardeners all the time. How are you growing cu- cucumbers? It's not that we can't grow it. It's learning when to grow. When is the right time to grow this? People will see me growing tomatoes like in January. And they're like, what are you doing growing tomatoes? I didn't know I could grow t- tomatoes. I'm like, where do you live? And then I have to. And I have to tell them, the only way we in the Florida can get tomatoes is in the fall, sometimes the winter, and spring. Summertime, we cannot grow tomatoes. We can't grow squash. We can't grow cucumbers because of the environment, the humidity, the rain, the heat. You know, just take time. Take time. It's not a race. So, you know, buy a couple seeds, and that's Another one of my pet peeves, because I did this. Everything I saw in the seed catalog, I bought it. And probably only 25% I could grow in my zone. Don't get caught into that, because it's so addicting, especially on social media when you see other people doing things to want to do that. But, you know, it's not a race. That is really good advice. I, too, have fallen prey to buying all of the seeds from the catalogs, being like, oh, yeah, that sounds great. And then I'm like, nope, not in Maine. Cool. (laughs) We should have, like, a box. I'll, like, ship you tomatoes in August, and you can ship me tomatoes. Yeah. That would be awesome. Papayas and all the stuff. Oh, my goodness. We should totally do that because, yeah, it's an absolutely, completely different can of worms. And when people move to different environments, if they've been growing in one area and then moving to a warmer environment, like even just like even a couple of hours away, there could be such a drastic difference. I'm in 9B, Florida, and then you have 9B, Texas. It's totally different than 9B, Florida, so. That's another thing, too. You can't just say I'm in a certain zone and we all can do this. You talked a little bit about the healing benefits of gardening for you, but, you know, obviously there are the benefits of eating fresh, nutrient-dense food. But I'd love for you to talk about your relationship with growing food and the ways that it's made a positive impact in your life and health and just, like, mental well-being. When I first started growing food, I went vegetarian. I stopped eating meat. I lost a lot of weight. My skin, my complexion, my health, my energy. My son, he was ar- he had already been doing it, but he wasn't doing it in a healthy way. He would do the, I'm going to eat French fries every day in a bag of potato chips. And <laughs> once I started growing food, he started eating the vegetables out of the garden as well as I, because I was that kid, like, the only vegetables that I really liked was collard greens, black eyed peas, lima beans, just certain things. But everything else, I hated vegetables. Like, I was that meat junk food child. So it wasn't until I started growing my own food, like, wow, lettuce really tastes good and this tastes good. And I started trying things that I wouldn't normally try from a grocery store because it tastes totally different than a grocery store when you're growing your own food and it's coming fresh off the vine. There's some things that don't, that never makes it to my, I just eat it raw. Like, and there's things that I've never heard of that I get to experience like longevity spinach. I absolutely love that. Like people ask me, do you cook it? And I'm like, no, better raw. And different types of kale, because when you go to the store, you only get a certain type of kale. And now I get to try Siberian kale and curly kale and all these different types of kales that you just can't get in the store. So the benefits of growing is you get to save on your grocery bill and you get to try things that you can't just buy. There are exotic fruits like um, pawpaws, not the papayas. I know some people call 
the pilot's paw paws, but paw paws that you have to eat fresh off the line because their shelf life does not last. So it allows me to get nutrients and it pushed me to start seeking healthier alternatives. It started pushing me to seeking, hey, what's the medicinal value in this plant? So now I'm not just looking at a plant as, oh, you're beautiful, like echinacea. I bought echinacea when I first started gardening because it was beautiful. And I had no idea that this, because it was named purple coneflower. I take echinacea. I would, I literally take the capsules every day over, the, you know, from the store, having no idea that the plant I was growing in my yard that was beautiful is actually medicinal. So it started pushing me into looking for other medicinal flowers, trees and shrubs. Like if I was just growing raspberry as a gardener, I wouldn't know the leaves of the raspberry is actually very medicinal for me as a woman. And I think with gardening, it just pushed me to another mindset of my health. And now I look at plants as what can you do for me internally, mentally, and spiritually? Because I haven't told this story in a long time. When I first started realizing my abandonment issues, I started to heal from those abandonment issues with plants. I would take a seed, and that's why I love growing from seeds. I would take a seed and I would plant it. And I would envision that seed as the child, the child me that was abandoned and neglected. And I would talk to that seed in a nurturing way, reassuring the seed that it is loved. And I still do this, talk to the plants and tell them I love them. And I would watch them grow. And as I did this, I felt like I would feel a piece of that abandonment part of me. And my soul was slowly being healed. And that's why I came up with the name Soul Gardener. Because for me, gardening is about healing my soul. A lot of trauma in my soul that has happened over my life. I felt like with each seed that I planted, with each tree that I talked to, that's why when people see me making the videos, they're like, oh my God, look look how you talk to your plants. I love it. And it's like, they don't realize that I talk to my plants because I, I feel like my plants understand me and it just makes me feel good. It's, it's healing for me to talk to my plants. There's scientific research that plants respond to human touch and talk and singing. I knew a gardener who sang to her plants and she had just the most beautiful, the most beautiful garden that she tended. And I just really think that they respond. I'd love for you to share a little bit about the book that you are writing on the subject of horticultural therapy, gardening as a means of healing. The book I'm writing is about roots of abandonment because my trauma, my issues in life that I didn't know I had was about abandonment, but how gardening and dealing with plants and trees and nature, not just the touching of it, but the every aspect of it, like watching a sunflower and watching the butterflies. I love to talk about the butterfly situation. This is why I'm addicted to butterflies because butterflies are the caterpillars. So the male and the female butterfly, they don't know each other. They hook up, the female gets pregnant, the guy runs off, pretty much leaves her and she takes the egg, lays the egg and leaves it. And in the beginning, it made me sad because I was like, man, that's me. My parents, they hooked up. Both my mom and dad just decided to leave me as a baby. And I would watch the little caterpillars as they come out the egg. Like they don't have a mother and they don't have a father, but they know they have the instincts on what they need to do. And I would watch them as they went through their different stages and they weren't pressed because that was 
a part of me that was making me depressed all the time, sad and crying. Like my parents left me. I wasn't good enough. And I was like, look at these little caterpillars. They're not stressed that, you know, their parents left them. They're not like, I'm a bad person. I can't become something beautiful. And then you watch them go into their chrysalis and they come out and they're beautiful and they go on with life and happy and repeat the whole cycle. And that helped me heal because I was like, you know, because society teaches us you have to have a mother and father, but not everybody has had that. But nature taught me that you didn't have it, but look at you. You still have become, you went through your stages. You went through your not knowing what to do in life, but still functioning to get through life. And then you still come out beautiful. Like, look what you're doing with the gardening and how people, you know, that you don't know are constantly telling you they're inspired by your, by what you're doing. So I relate myself to a butterfly and how nature has taught me that. And that's something I want, you know, with my book, I'm explaining like as I garden what I've learned and then the roots of abandonment, how you can take a plant who has bad roots who's in bad soil. It has nothing to do with, you know, sometimes it's not the seed or the plant, it's the environment. You can take them out of that environment. Even with the house plants, you can. You, I see it all the time, and I and I never understand how people don't get this analogy where they pretty much kill their house plants because that's what most people do is they overwater or they don't water, or, you know. So what they end up doing is cutting it, taking cut as because especially the ones who over water and the plants start getting root rot and start dying. So to save it, they cut it. And then they stick it in water. And then that, that leaf becomes a new plant and it builds new roots and it becomes something totally beautiful away from the system that it grew up on. And that's how I feel like my life is. Just because, you know, you were rooted in something doesn't mean you have to stay in that environment that you are rooted in. And nature has taught and that's the, that's what I'm writing in my book about roots of abandonment, because as I started realizing my issues and I started researching because I always have to research, you know, how can I heal from abandonment issues? There's not a lot of information out there about healing from abandonment issues. So I was like, this is an opportunity to share with others how I heal from abandonment issues with plants. And you hear it all the time, or you see it, and then I see it in people, and I'm like, they don't realize they got abandonment issues, and that's why they're clinging to plants. But I see it, and I'm like, I want to say something, but I'm like, no, I'll just wait for my book. <laughs> yeah, there are so many people that have those same feelings. And I don't know, I feel like for me, gardening is absolutely therapy. It really feels like you have found your life's purpose and your passion realized. And that's such a powerful thing to feel called to at any stage in life. I'd love for you to give any advice to people who feel like they're still searching for that spark, but like maybe they missed their window. Yeah. And it took me a long time to get here because I got pregnant when I was 16 and was in a relationship with my son's father for eight years. So all of my, all of those 18 years, you know, when you're in a relationship with somebody, you're trying to, you know, do things to make that person happy. So I supported the, his career and what he, his path in life. That's why it hurt me so much when it ended, because I was like, I don't even know who I am. I don't know what I like. Like, I literally just, even in that relationship, went to work all the time and supported what he wanted to do. And I was like, who am I? I I've never done anything that made me happy. So it it was hard for like 13 years after that relationship. I, it took 13 years after that relationship for me 
his eyes. I tell people this all the time. My mind, I was going to die alone. I already had saw that in my path. And I was like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to be here. I just exist. Maybe, you know, I came into this world to help him move on with his life. And I had no purpose. I had no passion. So don't give up. And the best thing to do is try, try something. Like if my coworker hadn't brought those plants, like, I, you know, the old me, somebody bringing me plants, like, if you don't get those plants out my face, you know, but if I, if I hadn't have been open and receptive to her and what she was trying to do, I probably would still be that bitter person on that path, being angry, just getting ready to die. So it's not too late. I'm 46 years old and I tell people it took me 43 years to realize my passion for gardening. It took me that long to realize like with gardening, it doesn't feel like work. You know, it feels like this is where I need to be and this is what I need to be doing. You know, I went and just threw my grandmother's yard together in no time because it didn't feel like work. It felt like a labor of love to me. My grandmother's 85 and she said she has always, all of her life, she always wanted a garden. Now she has it. She loves it. And I'm like, wow, I did that. She got to see that, you know, before she leaves this earth. And so for somebody who doesn't know what their path is, it's, it's okay to not know. But also be willing to be open to trying things that, because to me, gardening was for old people. <laughs> and that's how I felt like that. I'm not old. I'm not going to do that. But now I started thinking, look what you do. You come home and you go to bed. Why not? You know, give gardening a try. Give plants a try. And you don't have to go out there and buy a hundred plants. Just start with something. Just love it, nurture it, and talk to it. And these plants will give you the direction that you need to go in. Nurturing plants is just a way of nurturing yourself too. It's like something that you can care for. And I think that there are so many people who lose themselves in relationships. And when your partner leaves or that relationship dissolves, this like feeling of loss and who am I? And just really trying things and gardening can be a really great way to overcome that as well. You spoke a little bit about transforming your Nana's overground backyard into a food growing haven. And that's such a gift to give a loved one. How was that process? Because it looked like it happened just in record speed. It was such a, it was an overgrown. I mean, in Florida, everything just grows so fast and ferocious. <laughs> what was that process like kind of from start to finish? How long did it take you? And are there any insights that you give to others who are considering reclaiming overgrown, unused spaces to grow food? My son suffers from paranoia, schizophrenia. So he pretty much had been de depressed for a whole year, like literally just, you know, sleeping all the time. And I don't know, he just out of nowhere, I was like, because he saw what I did with my garden on my own. And he was like, let's build Nana, because that's what we call my grandma. Let's build Nana a garden. And he was like, he, we, he would go out there because we would go and visit and we would walk over to that area where we built the garden. And she already has edible trees in her garden. She didn't know she had an avocado. She has low pot trees. My uncle planted a mango tree that's fruiting for the first time this year once we started messing with the, the garden. We saw the potential, like, because I wanted to buy land. And we were looking at the land next to her. And we knew we couldn't afford the land. So my son was like, Let's just do it in grandma's garden till we make money because I was selling teas from my small space, but I was constantly running out of product. I couldn't keep up with the demand. So he was like, let's just 
build grandma a garden and we'll build her beds for her and then we'll plant lemongrass because that's like the number one thing that people wanted from me was lemongrass. We will plant lemongrass and harvest the lemongrass, but we'll build the beds for her because she always asked me to grow things. She's like, grow, can you grow me some okra? And I hate okra. And she and black eyed peas. So there was always certain things she always wanted me to grow for her. I was like, you know what? Let's build her a garden. So we would go over there and look and he'd be like, I could do this. I could do this in a week. I can tear this out in a week. And so I was like, boy, no, you can't. So I'm working from home now. So I could, I sit out there and I was like, I had been working from home six months. I'm like, I could have been coming over here working on my laptop and spending time with my grandma for six months. And I, and it dawned on me like, yeah. I'm not a tree. I can move around with my laptop. So he would go out there while I'm at work. The type of things that were out there was like a lot of invasive species, vines, air potatoes. It was like an Amazon type jungle, pretty much like how Florida is. So he would just go out and I'm like, you need to put on boots and you need to do this. What if there's snakes in there? He would be in there on his knees and he just worked. And as I watched him work, it was like he was working a lot of built up, you know, frustration out. And it was like he was being happy. He felt therapeutic and, you know, he was like he want he 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 was like I want to do this for people I want to do this for people who don't have money like grandma and I don't want to charge them anything I want to build gardens for people for free I'm like because I was spending the money to build the raised beds and stuff but the more we did that the more people were donating to us like this is for for Nana's garden so that that really helped a lot you know, getting things done for her because complete strangers would be motivated and inspired. Like the more they would see us do, the more people would chip in and help us. So it took him about a week and a half to clear out that space, cut down trees, dig up the vines. And so once he did that, he was like, his work, his work was done. Now I can make it pretty. That's what he said. That's when I came in and it took me, I think, like a week to bring in the wood chips for the floor, build the raised beds and fill the raised beds. Because what we did, it was so much like one of the biggest issues with an, an urban environment like my grandmother lives in is people used to use her yard as a walkway. So there was so many broken bottles and glass which is like pollution in the soil. Now the soil was absolutely, it's, it's amazing because, you know, all that overgrown stuff allowed for the beneficial microbes to exist. Like there, everywhere you dug, there was like 10 earthworms in the space. Like we couldn't dig anywhere where there wasn't an earthworm. The, the soil is rich and dark. We live in Florida. Like my sand, my yard is sand. My farmland is sand. I have to work like to get to what my grandmother has. Like even though people see weeds and they see overgrown, they don't understand the earth underneath that. That space is so rich. Like People pay for that type of soil. So we dug up, she had like 50 palm trees that we dug out too. So, but we dug out all of the, we sifted as much as we can, at least six inches high. Like there was so many glass bottles broken and we sheet mulch real thick with cardboard. There's already earthworms there. We want to encourage them to stay in that space. So, and we put the wood chips, filled the beds, and I think it took, we started in August, I think. It may have been August, September. By October, we were planting, and by November, we were harvesting collard greens and different things from that space. So, it took no time for us, and we're still building the space and adding to it. It just seems like it happened in no time, and she absolutely loves it. 
She's always going out there. She sits out there with friends. She takes my granddaughter, which is her great, great granddaughter out there and swing on the hammock. So she loves it. And it felt so good. Like when I go there, she comes and sits outside. So my next thing is to build her a bench because there's really no seating area out there. This episode is brought to you by Hessler Creative, a creative photography duo offering conceptualized brand content and in-person and online workshops. Hire us for elevated photos and videos to help your business rise above the noise and expand your customer reach. Or you can join us for an online or destination photography workshop. Explore new places, learn new techniques, and elevate your creative work. Learn more about our workshops and our commercial photography services by visiting HesslerCreative.com or click the collaborations button on UrbanExodus.com. What an amazing gift to just give somebody a space that they can be peaceful in, that they can get food from. And I hope your son can continue to do that too, if that's something that really feeds him, because that would be an amazing job, an amazing profession, an amazing organization to start doing that for other people. And that's why I wanted to get the farmland too, because I don't have the space to grow the plants that he needs to plant in the other people's yard. And he wanted to be able to collect wood and leaves and things like that. But we don't have the space to collect that. So I was like, he loves this and it helped him. It helped him heal too. Like it helped him with his anxiety and, you know, what he's going through mentally. So I was like, yeah, I need to do this because it's too many young people who are so attached to technology will never get to experience something like nature on this type of level. And, you know, him being young, hopefully he can inspire inspire people like him to get involved and pull away from, you know, technology because it's really, the technology is kind of depressing at times. It has its pluses and minuses, right? It has that aspect of community, but it's also really toxic. And if you have too much of it, you can really kind of silo yourself in this like fake world, (laughs) essentially. When I lived in the city, I used to just go to work, come home, watch TV, go to sleep. And it just didn't feel like there were any moments of like that real living How can people help support the continued build out and the mission of Soul Botanical Farms? And tell us about your goals for the future and and what you're going to be working on. I have a GoFundMe account. I'm on Instagram. And in my Instagram bio, I have my link tree, which has information about how to support me. Not just the GoFundMe. I'm starting my shop up again, my Etsy shop where I can sell a lot of my products because I made a lot of money to help raise money towards the land as well by selling products that I was already growing in my own garden. So they can support me by donating to my GoFundMe account or purchasing products from me. That can help a lot. I haven't gotten to the point where I can monetize my YouTube yet. It's just so much work I'm having to make videos and edit. And I like the garden more. So at the moment, the GoFundMe and supporting my shop. And my, my plans is with my land is, so the way the land is zoned, it does not have electricity and it does not have water. So I'm not allowed to get a permit because the, the space is so small. I think you have to have like, so many acres within um, a square mile, so many miles for that type of stuff. And my land can't have it. So I was like, for one, I was going to walk away from the land because of that. And then I started thinking, no, this is your opportunity for your lesson for your next level in life. Because I've always dreamed of living off grid where I get my electricity electricity through solar, where I get my water through 
rainwater harvesting because I'm one of those people who used to fall asleep every night watching tiny house adventure stuff and watching people live like that and dreaming. That's what I want to do. I want to be off the grid. I don't want to pay a light bill. I don't want to pay a water bill. So I said, you know what? This is the land isn't that much. This is the perfect opportunity for me to build the rain harvesting system, to set up the solar power, to power the, the farm, because I can't put chickens. I won't put chickens on there unless I got an electric fence, because I don't want to have to deal with predators getting to my chickens. So I'm focusing on getting the fencing set up getting the water management. The good thing about Florida is our rainy season is like from May to September and it still rain, rains off and on in October, November, December. So we have a wet season compared to other places like Vegas. And a lot of the plants that I'm planting trees, I can plant them during the rainy season. And once they're established, they don't need that constant watering. And that's the reason why I'm choosing perennial type herbs and trees because annuals need to be watered a lot. When you have a system and the older it gets, the least amount of hands on that you have to do to water that system. And I've been practicing in my backyard. And that's why I tell people when you see my trees this close together in the grass, and the herbs in between it, it's because I'm, I, I have been practicing on what I want my medicinal herb farm to look like because I'm planting the papayas, but in between the papayas, it's, a, it's more like an agroforestry type permaculture type farm. So that's my goal with my land is because I really don't see a lot of herb farmers. I have been researching and following some lately. And that's a lot of them said the reason why they got into it, because they don't have to use pesticide. They don't have to do as much as a vegetable market gardener type person. They, they have to constantly be turn, turning over fields. I can have a bed of echinacea for three years, you know, so... That's why I like where I'm going. And I hope to encourage more people because it's better for the environment, you know, when you're leaving the soil untouched for a longer period of time. Absolutely. And planting a whole bunch of different plants, plant diversity in your fields as opposed to just a monocrop. You know, if you're going to be fighting pests, it's it's better to have lots of different plants and Honestly, a lot of herbs, they don't have pest problems. Which, <laughs> that's why I love herbs. That's why I love them. Like, um, <laughs> I have basil out there three feet tall and three feet wide. And I'm like, nothing's eating it. But the, the bees absolutely love it. Like, I can't even get to sometimes because there's so many bees on it. That's amazing. Your tenacity to figure things out is really commendable. Like, recently building a greenhouse out of scrap wood without any plans. How do you overcome feelings of fear when it comes to taking risks and trying new things? All of my life from a childhood, I've been that child who did things and tried things. So for me, it's pretty easy. Now, when I became an adult because of, you know, there was a point where I used to be afraid to leave the house. I couldn't do things without people doing things with me. So I missed out on a lot of things in life. So the death of my sister really gave me the courage because it's like, you only have one life, do it. So, and I've learned that if you don't learn how to do things and try things on your own, you're going to have to constantly pay people and waste money that you can be using towards something else. So what I do is with the greenhouse, my initial plan was to buy a Harbor Freight greenhouse and I'm a researcher and I went out there and I would listen to other people reviews. You can't just read reviews, go on YouTube 
in today's age with technology, go out there. And I was listening to people saying, well, you know, we bought it, but they had to spend all these hundreds of dollars to put wood in it, to secure it. If not, you know, a gust of wind would just completely demolish it. And I was like, if I got to do all that extra building, why don't I build it? I started researching greenhouses and I noticed Texas Prepper. I think he was the first guy that really did the cattle panel greenhouses. So I watched his video and then I started watching other people's videos. And then everybody would tweak their greenhouses to their liking. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Tractor Supply had given me a $200 gift card. And I was like, perfect. I can get the cattle panels that I need. And the wood became an issue because I wanted my greenhouse to be two feet off the ground, whereas everyone else, their cattle panels was like on the ground, which would make the greenhouse small and kind of claustrophobic. And I was like, no, I wanted mine to be a little roomier. So I'm going to build it two feet off the ground. My grandmother raised beds were built two feet off the ground. So I had practice with doing that. I went and found a local, I found people working. I'm all, ever since I started getting in gardening and plants, my eyes is always on the side of the road for stuff that people throw away. So I saw a construction zone in my area and I've done this before where I stop and ask the contractor, hey, can I have scrap wood that you're throwing away? And they'll say yes. So I asked the um, contractor, can I have pieces of scrap wood? Because wood is so expensive right now. So the guy said, yeah, as long as it's in the dumpster or near the dumpster, you can have it. So me and my niece, and I had my niece with me. I probably would not have done that that day if my niece hadn't went with me. She one was like, let's do it. We didn't have a truck. We got my little car. And she called my cousin who has an SUV, and my cousin brought the SUV. And me and my niece that entire day went and loaded up the SUV going back and forth, bringing the wood back to the land. It was less than a mile from where my land is. And so I had no idea what to do. I just knew I wanted a greenhouse. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to start somewhere. And that's the way I've always been is just start somewhere and the rest will come. Like there's people that are friends and family of me who are afraid, afraid to, to start. And they won't do things because they're afraid to start. So I just started. And then as me and my niece was out there building, it just, the plan started coming to my head. And that's why I always tell people, I like in the beginning, I would always make videos, especially about my guard. This is what I'm going to do. And I'm like, it's in my head. You'll see, you'll see, because I'm more of a, let's plan it in my head. I'm not going to write it down because if I write it down, I will, I'm the type of person, if I put something down on paper, I'm a perfectionist. I will not do something because I'll keep going rewriting it. So if I don't just do it, I will be stuck in a a mode of, you know, rewriting stuff over and over. And that's pretty much where I'm at with my land. I haven't wrote anything yet about how I want to do my land. I said, if I do that, I'll get stuck. And I'm glad I did do it (laughs) because The longer it's taken me to get things done, the more I'm like, you know what? This is where the water tanks will go. This is where this will go. If I had a, because my initial plan with my land was plant moringa and lemongrass. It's going to be a moringa lemongrass farm. And that's it. And because my land was delayed, everything happens for a reason because the title company and it, then another 30 days I had to wait. And the more I had to wait, the more I was like, you know what? You can grow herbs like the African blue basil that doesn't, that's drought tolerant, the echinacea. You can put, you can put variety in there. You don't have to limit it to just moringa and lemongrass. So with me, I'm more of a, just do it. Like, what do you have to lose? 
because if you don't do it, you'll go through your life wishing you had a tribe. I'm like, what's the worst that can happen? You have to overcome your fears or you will always be like, people always tell me I'm living vicariously through you. And I'm like, I don't want you to live through me. I want you to live, you know, and I have friends like that now, like they won't do anything. I have a friend now, I brought her to our community garden. She wouldn't even go to the community garden unless I went. And finally, I just like, nope, I got things to do on my land. And now she goes on her own. I'm like, you have to step outside of your comfort zone because if you don't, you can't grow. Honestly, that's just a really beautiful way, I think, to end this because that really is what you exemplify is taking risks and finding what feeds you and what heals you and just going full steam towards a dream. I'm just so inspired by you, Katrina, and I think we're similar humans. It's like once we get something in our mind, we <laughs> we don't want to stop. And I am really excited for the future of Soul Botanical Farms, and I hope that everybody listening to this will contribute to your capital campaign, help you get things up and running, and make that dream a reality, because you're just creating a lot of good in the world and inspiring people. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Katrina Harvey. Katrina is an incredibly inspiring woman. Although she felt trapped by circumstance and heartbreak, she found her purpose and passion in life by harnessing the healing power of plants. Her growing journey has helped her realize her dream of building the only Black-owned farm and plant nursery in her area. Katrina's story illustrates that no matter the difficulties that life throws at you, it is never too late to start over and to find your peace and your calling in life. Say yes to new experiences. Get your hands dirty. And don't give up on finding something that feeds your soul. I encourage you to contribute to Katrina's capital campaign to get the infrastructure set up for her farm. You can find a link to her GoFundMe, additional interview responses, and pictures of her build-out on our blog by visiting urbanexodus.com. Hi, friends. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the Urban Exodus podcast. Urban Exodus is a labor of love, and it's only made possible by your generous support. Maybe you just discovered Urban Exodus, or maybe you followed the project for a long time. Either way, please consider supporting my efforts so I can keep this going. The first and easiest way is to click the support button at the top of urbanexodus.com and pledge any amount you like. Second, sponsor an episode of the podcast as a business or individual and get a 20-second ad spot in an upcoming episode. Just click the podcast link on urbanexodus.com to learn more. Third, you can sign up for an in-person or online workshop with me or one of the incredible creative professionals through our workshops at Howe Hill Farm. Click the workshops page on urbanexodus.com to learn more. Fourth, you can buy something from Jake.Art, our new Urban Exodus online shop. A fine art print or wall art for your home or office. A custom illustration or portrait of your family or loved one. There are so many cool things. Just click the shop page to peruse what's available. Lastly, you can hire me to photograph your business or family or take one of my online or destination workshops. Click the collaborations page on urbanexodus.com to learn more. Another really excellent way to support is to recommend Urban Exodus to your friends and relations. Also by giving a five-star ratings on iTunes to beat the algorithm and so that we can be more easily searchable. Your continued support will keep this passion project running. I want anyone who feels unfulfilled by career or circumstance to know that they have options and alternatives. All of the work that I do through this project is to encourage people to believe in themselves and to work towards a better future for their community and the planet. Thank you for helping me continue to do this work. You can find Urban Exodus on Instagram and Facebook at The Urban Exodus. To read more in-depth features on folks who ditch the city and win country, visit urbanexodus.com. Until next time, I'm Melissa Hessler, and this is The Urban Exodus.